UFC Fight Night Allen vs. Curtis 2 is this Saturday, and for each fight, including the prelims, I'm going to compare stats, review recent fight history, analyze the results of each of my seven data science prediction models, give a combined weighted prediction of those models, and then give a final prediction which considers both quantitative and qualitative information combined. Later this week, I'll also upload a video covering promising underdogs and inexpensive favorites to highlight some opportunities for you guys. Hopefully you can use these predictions and data to confirm your picks, avoid mistakes, and find some value bets, or just for entertainment and information to prepare for this upcoming event. Please like and subscribe if you find this interesting, informative, or helpful, as it'll help keep me motivated in creating these videos for you guys. I've also added my Patreon information in the description if you want to support me through that. Definitely not a requirement, but it would be very much appreciated. Running this data and analysis, each of the prediction models, the fight simulations, charts and graphs, and updating the site takes hours every day and week, so I'd greatly appreciate any kind of support. And thank you all for the recent support you have shown. I can't believe I'm at 490 subscribers. It truly means the world to me that we can all share our passion for MMA and build a community together. So let's go ahead and jump right in. For the first fight, opening the prelims, we have Nora Kernol versus Melissa Mullins. Let's go ahead and take a look at their stats. Nora Kernol and Melissa Mullins both stand at 5 feet 7 inches tall, sharing the same height. Kernol, at 34 years old, is slightly older than the 32-year-old Mullins. However, Mullins has a slight edge with a 68-inch reach versus Kernol's 67. Now, it's important to note that both of their stats come from one fight each, both of which were in late 2023. Looking at their striking, Mullins lands an average of 3.47 significant strikes per minute with a higher accuracy of 54%, compared to Kernol's 2.67 significant strikes per minute at a 51% accuracy. Mullins also absorbs more strikes per minute, absorbing 3.2 versus Nora, who absorbs 1.2. The striking defense percentages are comparable, with Kernol's at 57% and Mullins slightly lower at 55%. Both fighters have not shown takedown advantages, accuracy, or submission averages. Their takedown defense is available though, with Mullins defending 75% and Kernol defending 37%. Now let's check out how Nora Kernol has performed in her most recent UFC fights. Kernol has a win over Jocelyn Edwards, which took place on September 2nd, 2023 at UFC Fight Night Gone vs. Spivak. It was a striking affair, with Kernol landing 40 significant strikes without any takedowns or submission attempts, leading to a unanimous decision victory after three rounds. Her full record is seven wins and one loss, with five of her wins coming via KO slash TKO and one of her wins coming via submission. Her only loss was back in 2021 by decision. She's fought in UA Warriors, Hexagon MMA, and a couple other promotions prior to that. Now let's check out how her opponent, Melissa Mullins, has performed in her most recent UFC fight. Mullins also boasts a victory, having defeated Irina Alexeva at UFC Fight Night Yusa vs. Barboza on October 14, 2023. She landed 52 strikes while Alexeva landed 48, and similar to Cornell, Mullins didn't attempt any takedowns or submissions, securing her win through unanimous decision. Her total record is 6 wins and 0 losses, with 3 of her wins coming via KO slash TKO and the other 3 via unanimous decision. Let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weighted results, and my final prediction. 5 out of the 7 prediction models are leaning towards Melissa Mullins, with a confidence ranging from 51 to 70%, with only 2 models leaning towards Nora Kernol. When we weigh the models all together, we're left with Melissa Mullins as the likely winner, with a narrow 51% probability of victory. I honestly think she has a better chance of victory than that, so I'm going to go ahead and give her a 61% probability of victory, and I don't think she'll be able to finish Cornell here, so this one will go to the judges. In the next fight, we have Dylan Butka versus Cesar Almeida. Almeida was originally scheduled to face Josh Fremd, but he was forced out due to an injury. Let's go ahead and take a look at their stats. Dylan Butka stands at an imposing 6 feet tall with a reach that extends to 75 inches, giving him a 1 inch reach advantage over Cesar Almeida, who stands slightly taller at 6 feet and 1 inch tall. At 24 years old, Butka is notably younger than the 36 year old Almeida. It's important to note that each of these fighters' stats come from one fight as well, both of which were Dana White Contender Series fights. When we look into their striking, Almeida is the more active striker, landing an average of 4.73 significant strikes per minute with a 61% accuracy, while Butka only lands 1.47 with a higher precision of 66%. 
Butka also absorbs less damage with a significant strikes absorbed per minute rate of 0.73, contrasting with Almeida's 1.87, which could be a factor in a prolonged fight. Butka also has a takedown average of 2 with a 28% accuracy and a decent takedown defense. Almeida's grappling stats are absent except for his takedown defense. Butka also averages 1 submission per fight. Now let's check out how Dylan Butka has performed in that one Dana White Contender Series fight that he had against Chad Haincomb on September 5th, 2023. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced that last name. Butka secured a victory through unanimous decision and managed to land two takedowns and one submission attempt as well. He landed 22 strikes while Haincomb only landed 11. His total record is seven wins and two losses, with two of his wins coming via submission and one coming from KO slash TKO. His two losses were via split decision against LFA champ Azamat Bekoev last year and a rear naked choke submission earlier in his career against David Gladfelter. He's previously fought in SCS, LFA B2 Fighting Series, and Icon Fighting Championship. Now let's check out how his opponent, Cesar Almeida, has performed in his one Dana Fight Contender Series fight against Lucas Fernando on August 8, 2023. Almeida secured a unanimous decision win, demonstrating a striking heavy game plan. He impressively landed 71 significant strikes, while Fernando only landed 28. Fernando was also able to take him down three times and made a submission attempt, while Almeida recorded no takedowns or submissions. His professional MMA record is four wins and zero losses, with three of his wins coming via KO slash TKO. Now it's important to note that Almeida actually has a very rich fighting history. He's actually fought Alex Pereira three times, and he pulled off a decision win against him in WGP Kickboxing 17 back in December 2013. And although his three fights were from 2013 through 2015 with Alex Pereira, he definitely has a lot of experience under his belt. So even though he's the elder fighter in this fight, he has great experience. Unfortunately, since both of these fighters are making their UFC debut, I wasn't able to put them through my prediction models. The odds probabilities are indicating that Dylan Butka is expected to win with a narrow margin of 53%. Although Butka is the younger fighter and his stats looked better on paper in that one fight that we reviewed earlier, I actually think that Cesar Almeida is not getting enough credit for his experience and striking skill set. I'm going the opposite direction of the, of, of the odds here, and I'm picking the underdog Cesar Almeida to win with a 53% probability of victory. Given his experience and the fact that three of his four wins are via knockout, I honestly think he's going to finish Dylan Butka in this fight. In the next fight, we have Dan Argetta versus Gene Matsumoto. Let's go ahead and take a look at their stats. Dan Argetta stands at 5 feet 7 inches tall, equal in height to his opponent Gene Matsumoto, and both fighters also have an identical reach of 68 inches. At 30 years old, Argetta is 6 years older than the 24-year-old Matsumoto. It's important to note that while Argetta has a few fights that these stats are based on, Matsumoto's stats come from only one fight. When examining their striking, Argetta lands 2.35 significant strikes per minute with a striking accuracy of 47, compared to Matsumoto who throws a higher volume at 6.67 strikes landed per minute but with a less accuracy at 36%. Argetta absorbs fewer strikes per minute at 1.9 versus Matsumoto's higher 6.6. He also has a 52% striking defense compared to Matsumoto's 49%. In grappling, Argetta lands an average of 2.54 takedowns at a 50% completion rate with a notable takedown defense of 60%. On the other hand, Matsumoto has recorded no takedown attempts but has a 66% takedown defense. Additionally, Argetta has a submission average of 1.9. Now let's check out how Dan Argetta has performed in his most recent UFC fights. Argetta's last five fights show a fighter who's willing to mix it up on the ground and standing. His two recent fights were overturned, and prior to that he recorded a win against Nick Aguirre and a loss against Damon Jackson, both via unanimous decisions. Miles Johns was caught using a substance, which is why that fight was deemed a no contest, and the other fight was a no contest because the ref had made an error, thinking Lawrence had tapped during a submission attempt, even though he didn't tap. Argetta had a pretty tight guillotine in that fight, so that speaks to his skills. His total record is 9 wins and 1 loss, with 4 wins coming from submission and 2 coming from KO slash TKOs. His only loss was to Damon Jackson. Now let's check out how his opponent, Gene Matsumoto, performed in his fight against Casey Tanner on Dana White's Contender Series back in September 2023. Matsumoto landed 100 strikes and won via unanimous decision. 
Tanner really came to fight, and Matsumoto displayed exactly what you want to see from a rising fighter. He had a good chin, good stamina, technical skills. He's honestly a scrapper. He has a lot of potential. His total record is 14 wins and 0 losses, with 5 of his wins coming from submission, and 3 wins coming via KO slash TKO. Now prior to this fight, he fought at LFA, Fight Pro Championship, where he got the title, SFT, where he also got a title, and other promotions as well. Now unfortunately, with Matsumoto making his UFC debut, I wasn't able to put these fighters through my prediction models, but the odds probabilities are heavily favoring Gene Matsumoto, giving him a 65% probability of victory. I agree with that prediction, given the striking performance in his recent fight and his ability to stuff takedowns, which is where Argetta really excels, Matsumoto seems well positioned for a potential victory. Considering all of the data from their recent fights and their stats, the most likely method of victory would be a decision win, capitalizing on his high volume striking while neutralizing Argetta's grappling threats. In the next fight, we have Piero Rodriguez versus Cynthia Calvillo. Let's go ahead and take a look at their stats. Piero Rodriguez stands at 5 feet 3 inches tall with a reach that matches her height, while Cynthia Calvillo is slightly taller at 5 feet 4 inches with a reach that also matches her height. At 31 years old, Rodriguez has an age advantage over the 36 year old Calvillo. Rodriguez has a significant strikes landed per minute rate of 3.46 with a 46% striking accuracy, which is lower than Calvillo's 4.41 significant strikes landed per minute at a lower accuracy of 38%. Rodriguez also absorbs less strikes per minute at 2.98 compared to Calvillo's 4.12. Both showcase strong striking defenses, Rodriguez at 57% and Calvillo even higher at 64%. On the ground, Rodriguez attempts more takedowns with an average of 3.31 per 15 minutes at a 41% accuracy and defends takedowns 66% of the time. Calvillo, though with fewer attempts, has a better takedown defense rate of 77%, a lower takedown average of 1.8 at a slightly higher 44% accuracy, and has a 0.8 submission average as well. Now let's check out how Piero Rodriguez has performed in her most recent UFC fights. Rodriguez is coming off a loss to Gillian Robertson via armbar submission, which may signal the start of a downtrend. Prior to that though, she's defeated Sam Hughes, Kay Hansen, and Valeska Machado all via unanimous decision. Her victories demonstrate a versatile skill set, mixing in a significant number of takedowns to control her fights while also landing more strikes than her opponents, which is a strategy that she's consistently utilized to earn her wins. Now let's check out how her opponent, Cynthia Calvillo, has performed in her most recent UFC fights. Calvillo has faced a tough run with 5 straight losses, 3 by decision and 2 by KO slash TKO. To be fair, her two most recent fights were split decision losses, one of which was against Lupi Godinez. Despite this streak, she has maintained high striking volumes recently, even through her defeats, and has been able to secure takedowns. Prior to these fights, she has had wins recorded against Jessica I, Courtney Casey, Carla Esparza, but again, those were 2020 and prior. Let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weighted results, and my final prediction. The models present a mixed opinion, with a slight lean towards Piero Rodriguez at 54% when they're weighed together. My final prediction is slightly higher than the weighted predictions, putting Rodriguez with a 60% chance of victory against Calvillo's 40%. Considering Rodriguez's back-to-back -back wins prior to her loss, and ability to mix striking with takedowns against Calvillo's higher volume striking but recent losses, I think Rodriguez is more likely to win. Momentum plays a huge role in a fight like this, and Calvillo is at the decline of her professional fighting career. I see this going to the judges and Rodriguez getting the decision. In the next fight, we have Hila Alatang versus Victor Hugo. Let's take a look at their stats. Alatang stands 5 feet 5 inches tall and has a reach of 66 inches. At 32 years old, he has a higher significant strikes per minute rate of 2.88 with a similar striking accuracy of 33%. His defensive game appears solid, with a striking defense of 58% and a notable takedown defense of 72%. However, his striking absorption rate is high at 5.03. It's important to note that Victor Hugo's stats come from one fight. Hugo is a slightly taller fighter at 5 feet 7 inches tall, with a 5 inch reach advantage at 71 inches. Hugo has a lower significant strikes per minute rate of 1.24, but a comparable striking accuracy of 34%. His defense is stronger at 65%, and he absorbs significantly fewer strikes with an absorption rate of 1.1. Hugo likes to grapple and has a higher takedown average of 2.06 and a higher accuracy at 50%.
His submission average is 4.10 and his takedown defense is at 66%, but again, this is all coming from one fight. Now let's check out how Alatang has performed in his most recent UFC fights. He's shown a mixed bag of results with a recent loss to Chris Gutierrez, but a win against Chad and Helliger. But he also has a KO such TKO victory over Kevin Kroom in a draw against Gustavo Lopez, which shows that he can be both resilient and dangerous in the octagon, with the ability to end fights both in the distance and on his feet. His total record is 16 wins, 9 losses, with 5 wins coming via KO slash TKO, and 3 wins coming via submission. His 9 losses were mostly by decision, but he's been finished 4 times, 3 of which were KO slash TKOs, and 1 of which was via submission. Now let's check out how his opponent, Victor Hugo, has performed in his Dana White Contender Series fight against Eduardo Torres Cao back in October 2023. Hugo submitted Eduardo via knee bar in the second round. His grappling skills are impressive, even historically. His total record is 24 wins and 4 losses, and 10 of his wins are via submission and 7 are via KO slash TKO. Two of his 4 losses came via KO slash TKO, and the other two were a decision and a submission loss. He's a well-rounded fighter that can take it to the distance, he can also knock out his opponents or even submit them. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't put these two fighters through the prediction models because Victor Hugo is making his debut. However, the odds probabilities are giving Hugo a 57% probability of victory. Now, I agree with that prediction considering Hugo's defensive capabilities and his efficient grappling. His ability to avoid damage and control the ground game does give him the edge in my opinion. I honestly see him submitting Alatang in this fight. Alatang will really need to leverage his striking and keep the fight standing if he wants to win this fight. In the next fight, we have Norma Dumont versus Jermaine Durandamy. Let's go ahead and take a look at their stats. Dumont stands at 5 feet 7 inches tall and has a 67 inch reach. At 33 years old, she strikes at a rate of 3.41 significant strikes per minute with a 49% accuracy, while absorbing 1.99 significant strikes per minute and boasts a striking defense of 66%. Her ground game includes a takedown average of 1.39 with a takedown accuracy of 64%, and a remarkable takedown defense at 72%. Durandame, on the other hand, is 2 inches taller at 5 feet 9 inches with a 4 inch reach advantage, and she's also 6 years older at 39 years old. She has a slightly lower striking rate of 2.72 significant strikes landed per minute at a slightly lower 46% accuracy. She absorbs 2.14 significant strikes per minute, slightly higher than Dumont, and her striking defense is close to Dumont's at 65%. However, her grappling stats show she has a takedown defense slightly lower than Dumont's at 69%. Her age is a factor that might impact her performance in this fight, but I like the height and especially the reach advantage that she brings. Now let's break down how Norma Dumont has performed in her most recent UFC fights. Dumont has shown consistent performances, clinching victories in four of her last five fights, all by unanimous decision except for a split decision loss against Macy Chieson. She has victories against Chelsea Chandler, Carol Rosa, Danielle Wolfe, and Aspen Ladd. The fight against Ladd stands out, with Dumont achieving an impressive 65 strikes. However, in her loss to Macy, she struggled with being taken down six times. Dumont's ability to maintain a higher striking volume and control in her recent fights suggests a strategy that favors striking over grappling, which is a factor to consider in this fight. Now let's check out how her opponent, Jermaine Durandame, has performed in her most recent UFC fights. Now here's the thing, she hasn't really fought recently. In fact, her most recent fight was three and a half years ago, so we don't really know what she's capable of now. Her fight history is similar to Dumont's with four wins and one loss. Now, to her credit, she did secure a guillotine choke submission win over Juliana Pena and a knockout victory against Aspen Ladd, which are impressive finishes against well-known fighters. Her loss to Amanda Nunes does stand out, where she was taken out eight times, but come on guys, it's Amanda Nunes, I mean, what else do we really expect? Let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weighted results, and my final prediction. The odds probability favored Dumont, and this trend is echoed in all of the prediction models except for one. Notably, the models employing machine learning techniques such as neural network and support vector machines, as well as the simulations approach, show strong support for Dumont with probabilities ranging from 62% to a high of 80%. The gradient boosting model, however, favors Randomay with a 55% probability. Despite the variance, the overall consensus amongst the models clearly tips towards Dumont, reflected in a weighted model's prediction of 62%. 
Now, my final prediction, which is slightly higher than the weighted prediction here, is that Norma Dumont has a 64% probability of defeating Germaine de Randomé. Considering Dumont's consistent striking, her takedown defense, and her recent performance, along with the models favoring her, the most likely method of victory will be by unanimous decision. Dumont's striking and takedown defense give her the edge here, and I think she'll control this fight. In the next fight, we have Court McGee versus Alex Morono. Now let's go ahead and take a look at their stats here. Court McGee and Alex Morono match up with an identical height of 5 feet 11 inches. McGee, at 39 years old, has a 75-inch reach and launches 4.63 significant strikes per minute, but his striking accuracy is 37%. Morono, younger, at 33 years old, with a slightly lesser 72-inch reach, has an even higher significant strikes landed per minute at 5.02 and a slightly better striking accuracy at 41%. McGee absorbs less strikes at 3.68 per minute compared to Morono's 4.17 and has a marginally higher striking defense at 60% against Morono's 58%. Grappling stats reveal McGee's takedown average is at 1.89 with a 25% accuracy, significantly outperforming Morono's 0.34 average with a 22% accuracy. However, Morono's takedown defense is weaker at 50% compared to McGee's 69%, and both of these guys have a similar submission average of around 0.3 to 0.4. Their stats suggest McGee might utilize his grappling advantage, whereas Morono may rely on his striking. But let's go ahead and dive deeper and check out how Court McGee has performed in his most recent UFC fights. McGee's last five fights present a tale of highs and lows, with a relatively balanced record of two wins and three losses. His victories over Ramiz Brahimaj and Claudio Silva came by unanimous decision, displaying his well-rounded skill set with a notable performance against Brahimaj where he landed 54 significant strikes and executed 5 takedowns, even landing a knockdown. However, a loss to Matt Brown and Jeremiah Wells, both by knockout, suggests vulnerabilities to McGee's stand-up defense when facing strikers. Now let's check out how his opponent, Alex Morono, has performed in his most recent UFC fights. Morono's recent track record is slightly more favorable than McGee's, with three wins and two losses. His wins over Matthew and Mickey Gall were both unanimous decision wins, highlighting his striking ability with over 100 significant strikes in the fight against Matthew. More recently, he successfully executed a guillotine choke against Tim Means back in May 2023. Looking at his losses, he has a recent unanimous decision loss to Joaquin Buckley and a third round knockout loss from Santiago Ponzinibbio. Let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weighted results, and my final prediction. The odds probability strongly favors Morono at 74% against McGee's 26%, which is a significant difference. The models gave an interesting evaluation for this fight. Although more models lean towards McGee, their probability is relatively flat. And when you weigh the models together, they actually give a very narrow prediction for this fight, giving Alex Morono the victory with a 50.1% probability. That's the closest prediction I've ever seen, honestly. I don't think the stats or prediction models are honestly correctly picking up the clear advantages that Morono has in this fight. So for my final prediction, I'm going to bump that number up to a 63% probability that Alex Morono gets the job done. And I think it will go the distance. He could drop McGee and get the knockout, but I think it's more likely going to go the distance. In the next fight, we have a fan favorite fight, Trevor Peak versus Charlie Campbell. Now I know this is going to be a very fun fight. Let's go ahead and take a look at their stats. Trevor Peak stands at 5 feet 9 inches tall at 29 years old with a 70 inch reach. He lands an impressive 5.09 significant strikes per minute with a significant strike accuracy of 56%. Now he absorbs 4.37 strikes per minute, but he has a striking defense of 44%. His takedown average is 1.76 with a 50% takedown accuracy, and his takedown defense is at 51%, which indicates he has a balanced approach between stand-up and some groundwork. His striking is pretty funny with his hammer fists. I mean, he's a real caveman when it comes to fighting, but recently he looks, he looks a bit more technically sound overall. Now Charlie Campbell, on the other hand, he's slightly taller at 6 feet with a 72-inch reach and he has a 3-inch height advantage and a 2-inch reach advantage. It's important to note that Campbell's stats come from only two fights, one which was against Alex Reyes and the other which was against Chris Duncan, and that Chris Duncan fight was a Dana White Contender Series fight about one and a half years ago. Now at 28 years old, Campbell outdoes peak in significant strikes landed per minute at 11.03, though with a slightly lower accuracy of 54%. Campbell absorbs more significant strikes at 5.42 per minute, but he has a better defense at 60%.
Now let's check out how Trevor Peak has performed in his most recent UFC fights. Peak's record in his last four outings is notable with three wins and only one loss. He's shown an ability to finish fights as seen with his knockouts against Eric Gonzalez and Malik Lewis. Although he's experienced a unanimous decision loss to Shep Mariscal, his ability to maintain a high rate of significant strikes in his fights is clear, with at least 51 strikes landed in his victories. His total record is 9 wins and only 1 loss, and 8 of those 9 wins were via KO slash TKO, so he has some crazy finishing power, honestly. He's previously fought at Aries Fight Series and Alabama Fighting Championship. Now let's check out how his opponent, Charlie Campbell, has performed in his two recent fights. Campbell's recent fight history is brief but telling, with one knockout win over Alex Reyes and a knockout loss to Chris Duncan. His victory came within the first round, demonstrating his power and his ability to end fights pretty early. His total record is 8 wins and 2 losses, with 6 of his 8 wins coming via KO slash TKO. So you can already get a sense of how this fight is going to go with these two fighters. Now prior to UFC, he's fought at CFFC, and he's also had a couple fights at Bellator, and he's also fought at Ring of Combat, but that was back in 2019. Let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weighted results, and my final prediction. The odds probability favors Campbell at 66% against Peak's 34%. The prediction models show a mix of support, with a significant lean towards Campbell, especially highlighted by the neural network and support vector machine models, which predict a 73% and 89% probability of victory in his favor, respectively. However, the 1000 fight simulation model swings dramatically towards Peak at 74%, suggesting that when the dynamics of many fights are considered, Peak might have an edge. The weighted model's prediction gives a more balanced view giving Campbell a 64% probability and Peak a 36% probability. Now my final prediction is similar but slightly more conservative, giving Campbell a 63% probability of victory. Now, I do respect Peak's ability and his skills and his crazy striking as well. He lands significant strikes and sometimes mixes in grappling as well. Honestly, Peak is capable of winning this fight, and looking back at this, I should have probably given a final prediction of 55% to Campbell instead of 63%, this could be a knockout from either fighter, I'm just leaning more towards Campbell given his volume and output, his ability to outwork fighters, his power, his height and reach advantages, and the model's evaluations. In the next fight, we have Walter Walker versus Lucas Bresky, and if you guys didn't know, Walter Walker is actually Johnny Walker's half-brother. Let's take a look at their stats here. Walter Walker towers at 6 feet 6 inches tall, giving him a notable presence in the octagon at 26 years old. With an 81-inch reach, he could control the distance against most opponents. We don't have very many stats on him, but I'll review his fight history and his record in the next section. He's facing Lucas Bresky, who is 5 years older than him at 31 years old. He stands at 6 feet 4 inches tall with a 78-inch reach. So Bresky has a 2-inch height disadvantage and a 3-inch reach disadvantage. Bresky throws significant strikes at a solid rate of 5.08 per minute with a 48% accuracy and absorbs 3.46 strikes per minute. His striking defense is commendable at 57%, and though his takedown average is low at 0.64, he's got a decent takedown accuracy of 50% and a defense at 42%. His submission average is also 0.6. Now let's talk about Walter Walker's experience, and although he doesn't have any UFC experience and he will be making his UFC debut, his full record is 11 wins and 0 losses with an impressive 6 KO slash TKO victories and even a submission win. He's fought in Titan FC where he defeated champ Alex Nicholson, and he fought in MMA series where he defeated champ Cassio Barboza de Oliveira. Now prior to that, he fought in Arena Global and FFC. He's young, he's got finishing power, some grappling in his back pocket, and he's been tested in other promotions. Now let's check out how his opponent, Lucas Bresky, has performed in his most recent UFC fights. Bresky's record shows a challenging recent history with three losses following a single win back in 2021. He was knocked out by Waldo Cortes Acosta and suffered a decision loss to Carl Williams and a decision loss to Marin Boudet, although that one was a split decision and he landed 118 strikes. However, he secured a submission victory over Dylan Potter via rear naked choke, demonstrating his grappling skills. His total record is 8 wins and 4 losses, with 6 wins coming via KO slash TKO and 1 win via submission. His 4 losses are split, with 2 coming from KO slash TKO and 2 from decisions. Let me be honest with you guys, his career is on the decline and I think we all know where this fight is headed. 
Now, unfortunately, with Walter Walker making his debut, I wasn't able to put these fighters through my prediction models, but the odds probability are predicting a confident 76% victory for Walker. Although we don't have stats to go off of, looking at his recent performances, his record, and what he's done so far, how he's been tested in the smaller promotions, I'd say this fight is pretty easy to read. Bresky hasn't really been doing well recently, and he's carrying a lot of negative momentum, which is likely going to take a toll on his mentality coming into this fight against an undefeated prospect. Bottom line, Walker gets it done and knocks Bresky out cold. In the next fight, we have Ignacio Bahamondes versus Christos Giagos. Let's take a look at their stats. Ignacio Bahamondes stands at 6 feet 3 inches tall. He has a 5 inch height advantage and brings a significant reach of 75 inches into the octagon at the age of 26. With an impressive significant strikes per minute rate of 6.97 and a striking accuracy of 46%, he's an aggressive fighter who is not afraid to engage. However, with that being said, he also absorbs a considerable number of strikes at 4.36 per minute, indicating potential openings in his defense, which stands at a decent 57%. He has a takedown defense of 85% and a submission average of 0.4, which is equal to Christos Giagos. Now, Giagos, on the other hand, measures up at 5 feet 10 inches tall with a 71-inch reach at 34 years old. He has a 4-inch reach disadvantage. He delivers fewer strikes per minute at 2.98, with a 42% accuracy and absorbs just slightly less than he lands, with a significant strikes absorbed per minute rate of 2.95. His striking defense is a bit lower at 51%, and his takedown average is better than Bahamondes at 2.93, although his accuracy is moderate at 37%. And lastly, Giagos has a 52% takedown defense, while Bahamondes has that 85%. All right, so let's take a look at how Ignacio Balmondes has performed in his most recent UFC fights. His last five fights show a pattern of high engagement with a significant number of strikes thrown in each fight. He suffered a loss to Ludovic Klein, but had three back-to-back -back wins prior to that, which was against Trey Ogden, Rongzu, and Roosevelt Roberts. His wins were from a decision, a guillotine choke, and a KO slash TKO, so he's a pretty versatile fighter. Prior to those fights, he suffered a split decision loss to John McDessey on the Vittoria vs. Holland card back in April 2021. Now, his total record is 14 wins and 5 losses, and 9 of his wins came from KO slash TKOs, and 1 win came from submissions. He's had 3 decision losses and 2 submission losses. Now let's check out how his opponent, Christos Giagos, has performed in his most recent UFC fights. Giagos has experienced mixed results with 3 losses and 2 victories. His recent loss to Daniel Zellhuber came after absorbing 36 significant strikes and being submitted via Anaconda Choke. Prior to that, he beat Ricky Glenn by KO slash TKO in the first round. And prior to that, he suffered losses to Tiago Moises and Armin Sarukian by submission and KO slash TKO respectively. Going back a little bit further than that, he defeated Sean Soriano via Darce Choke. His total record is 20 wins and 11 losses, with 8 wins coming via KO slash TKO, four wins coming via submission, and the remaining eight wins being via decision. He's been subbed six times and KO slash TKO'd twice. He has a mixed record, but he is capable of finishing fights in different ways. So now let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weighted results, and my final prediction. Most models, including the 1000 fight simulations, the neural network model, and the support vector machine model, strongly favor Bahamondes with probabilities ranging from 51% up to an impressive 94%. The weighted model's prediction puts Bahamondes at a 67% probability of victory, indicating a solid expectation of his victory. Now, my final prediction actually sits even higher at 73%. I really like his high volume striking, his recent performances, and his takedown defense. I think he'll control this fight's pace standing up, eventually finding an opening and finishing Giagos via KO slash TKO. All right, in the next fight, we have Morgan Charrier versus Shep Mariscal. This is going to be a fun fight. Let's take a look at their stats. Morgan Charrier and Shep Mariscal have an identical reach of 69 inches, though Charrier stands a little bit taller at 5 feet 8 inches compared to Mariscal's 5 feet 7 inches. It's important to note that Morgan Charrier's stats come from only one fight, and Shep Mariscal's stats come from only two fights. Charrier's significant strikes per minute stands at an impressive 6.75, with a striking accuracy of 53%. His defense is notable, successfully thwarting 78% of strikes. Mariscal, at 31 years old, has a lower strikes landed per minute rate at 4.67, 
and matches Charrier's striking accuracy at 53%. However, he absorbs more strikes at 3.95 per minute and has a worse defensive rate at 52%. With a takedown average of 3.22 at a 38% accuracy and a decent takedown defense, Mariscal showcases a more versatile game with ground capabilities, but the striking advantages go to Morgan Charrier. Now let's check out how Morgan Charrier has performed in his one fight. He finished Manolo via KO slash TKO in round one, and he landed 26 strikes. His total record is 19 wins and 9 losses with one draw. He has 11 KO slash TKO finishes and 3 submission finishes, and his losses were mostly by decision, although he has been submitted once as well. His, he's previously fought at Cage Warriors where he defeated champion Perry Goodwin, but lost twice after that. He's also fought at WWFC and European Beatdown, along with a few other promotions as well. Now on the other hand, we have Shep Mariscal. Let's see how he performed in his two fights. He defeated Jack Jenkins via KO slash TKO and Trevor Peak via unanimous decision. The Trevor Peak win really put him on the map because Peak had a lot of momentum and support going into that fight. His total record is 15 wins and 6 losses. He's pulled off 7 KO slash TKO victories and 3 submissions as well. His losses were via decision and 3 were via KO slash TKO. Let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weighted results, and my final prediction. The prediction models overwhelmingly favor Morgan Charrier. Notably, the neural network and the 1000 fight simulations show strong support for Charrier with 73% and 95% probabilities respectively. When we weigh the prediction models together, they give a weighted probability of 56% in favor of Morgan Charrier. My final prediction gives Charrier a slightly more confident 60% probability of victory. This one was really hard to call, honestly. I respect Shep Mariscal's ability, and I know he's fully capable of winning this fight as well. I think Sharier striking can draw this fight out and take it to the judges. I don't think that he will finish Mariscal, honestly. This should be a fun fight overall, and I'm looking forward to this one to see both of these guys get tested. In the next fight, we have Alexander Hernandez versus Damon Jackson. Let's take a look at their stats. Alexander Hernandez stands at 5 feet 9 inches tall and has a reach of 72 inches, while Damon Jackson is a bit taller at 5 feet 11 inches with a reach that's an inch shorter at 71 inches. Hernandez is younger by 4 years and brings more striking volume to the fight with a significant strikes per minute rate of 4.63 compared to Jackson's 3.02. However, their striking accuracy is almost identical, around 40%. Hernandez absorbs more strikes per minute at 4.9 than Jackson does at 3.46, but Hernandez has a 6% higher striking defense. When it comes to grappling, Jackson outperforms with a higher takedown average and accuracy. Hernandez, on the other hand, has a better takedown defense at 60%. Submissions aren't really a strong suit for Hernandez, with an average of 0.10 compared to Jackson's 1.6. Hernandez prefers the stand-up fight game, while Jackson is a more versatile fighter, especially on the ground. Now let's check out how Alexander Hernandez has performed in his most recent UFC fights. It's been a bit of a roller coaster for Hernandez with a mixed bag of wins and losses. He has two wins and three losses in his five most recent fights. His last fight was a unanimous decision loss to Bill Algio, which came after a unanimous decision victory against Jim Miller. Now prior to that, he suffered back-to-back -back losses against Billy Quarantillo and Renato Moicano via KO slash TKO and rear naked choke submission respectively. Prior to those fights, he defeated Mike Breeden via KO slash TKO in round one. His total record is also a bit of a mix, with 14 wins and 7 losses. Six of his wins were via KO slash TKO, and two are via submission, so he does have a little grappling in his back pocket. His losses are also mixed with three via KO slash TKO, three via decision, and one via submission. Now let's check out how his opponent, Damon Jackson, has performed in his most recent UFC fights. Jackson also displays a mixed record with two recent back-to-back -back losses and three back-to-back -back wins prior to that. He suffered a unanimous decision loss to Billy Q and a KO slash TKO loss to Dan 50k Ige. Prior to that, he finished Pat Sabatini. He got a unanimous decision victory against Dan Argetta and nailed an arm triangle submission against Kamuela Kirk. His total record is impressive when it comes to his grappling skill. He has 22 wins and 6 losses and 1 draw. Now 15 of those wins are via submission, can you believe that? And 4 of his wins are via KO slash TKO. His losses are mostly by KO slash TKO, but he has also been submitted just once and he has also lost to a decision. His grappling is insane, but he runs the risk of getting caught and being finished against strikers. 
Let's review who the prediction models picked to win this fight, the weighted results, and my final prediction. All prediction models are leaning towards Damon Jackson, valuing his grappling skills against Alexander Hernandez as striking. When we weigh all of the models together, Damon Jackson is favored to win with a 55% probability of victory. I'm actually going to go opposite of the prediction models here though, and I'm going to choose Alexander Hernandez, which I know it sounds kind of crazy, but I think he gets the KO slash TKO here. He has a slight reach advantage, a slightly better striking accuracy, better striking defense. I think his takedown defense could kind of negate a finish from Damon Jackson. Plus, Damon Jackson has faced back-to-back -back losses, which I think will take a toll on him, especially after the Dan Ige fight and being KO slash TKO'd. This one should be a fun fight as well, especially considering the different strengths that these two fighters bring. But bottom line, I believe Alexander Hernandez gets the job done. In the next fight, we have our main event, Brandon Allen versus Chris Curtis. This fight is actually a rematch. Both fighters faced each other on December 4th, 2021 on the Font vs. Aldo card. Chris Curtis KO slash TKO'd Brendan Allen in round 2 of that fight, but can he do it again? Let's take a look at their stats. Brendan Allen stands at 6 feet 2 inches tall with a reach that extends to 75 inches. His opponent Chris Curtis stands at 5 feet 10 inches with the same 75 inch reach. So Curtis has a 4 inch height disadvantage. Age-wise, Brandon Allen is 8 years younger at 28 years old compared to Chris Curtis who is now 36. When it comes to the striking game, Curtis lands more blows per minute at 5.96 compared to Allen's 3.87, but Allen's strikes are slightly more accurate at 54%. Curtis also absorbs much more strikes at 6.58 compared to Allen at 3.6. Allen shows proficiency on the ground with a submission average of 1.7, and a solid takedown defense of 58%, suggesting he's comfortable both standing and on the mat. Curtis has a decent takedown defense, but no takedowns or submissions. Now let's check out how Brandon Allen has performed in his most recent UFC fights. It's been an impressive series of victories for Allen, who's now on a winning streak. His victories have been a consistent theme, submissions, 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 with rear naked chokes being a particular specialty of his. He's won his last four fights in a row with rear naked chokes, demonstrating a clear strength in grappling and submission tactics. He's defeated the likes of Paul Craig, Bruno Silva, Andre Muniz, and Jacob Malkoon. His total record is 23 wins and 5 losses, with 14 of his wins coming via submission and 5 of his wins coming via KO slash TKO. He's been finished 3 out of 5 times, with 2 of his losses coming from KO slash TKO and 1 via submission. Now let's check out how his opponent Chris Curtis has performed in his most recent UFC fights. Curtis's fight history paints a picture of a fierce competitor with varied results. His record is a bit more mixed with two wins, two losses, and a no contest due to a head clash. He's coming off of a split decision win against Mark andre Barial, which was followed by the head clash no contest against Nasruddin Imavov. Prior to that, he lost via unanimous decision to Jack Hermanson. His total record is an impressive 30 wins and 10 losses. 17 of his 31 wins are via KO slash TKO and 1 is via submission. Most of his losses are by decision. Let's review who my prediction models picked to win this fight, the weighted results, and my final prediction. Most of the models are favoring Brandon Allen with only two of them siding with Chris Curtis. The 1000 fight simulations strongly favor Allen with a 79% prediction, which suggests that when variables are played out extensively, Allen often comes out on top. The neural network model, on the other hand, predicts a win for Chris Curtis at a high 72%. Most other models, however, favor Allen, albeit by narrower margins. This pattern suggests that while Curtis may have standout abilities that certain models pick up on overall, Allen's consistent performance across various metrics gives him the edge. The weighted model's prediction slightly leans towards Allen at 55%. My final prediction, slightly higher than the weighted predictions given Allen's skill and momentum, is that Brandon Allen has a 60% probability of defeating Chris Curtis. The deciding factor is without a doubt Allen's grappling and submission skills. I think he gets another submission victory in this fight, especially considering how Chris Curtis isn't big on grappling. I think he honestly learned from his loss to Chris Curtis in their first fight. Maybe he gets another rear naked choke and keeps his streak alive. However, he'll need to be very cautious of Curtis's striking power, which could turn the tide if the fight remains standing. I respect Curtis's abilities and power, but ultimately, Allen gets the job done here. And with that being said, my friends, those are all of the fights for UFC Fight Night Allen vs. Curtis 2.
Thank you all so much for watching. Please like and subscribe as it will help keep me motivated in creating these videos. Again, running this data, the analysis, the prediction models, charts and graphs, it takes hours every day and week, so I'd really appreciate the support. Check out the Patreon if you can, but it's not required, obviously. Thank you guys so much and see you guys in the next one.